So we have St. Theophilus of Antioch, who was the seventh bishop of Antioch. The thing that was most fascinating to me was the chronology of the world and all of the kings. I thought that was kind of interesting that he went through that. The book talked about, in his final argument, he presents the detailed chronology that began with the first man and continued the time of the emperor. But that's all it was. There wasn't any biblical history. It was just naming the people. But I thought, wow, that took a lot of work for him to do that. Or is that already, Ron, um, in the somewhere already? From the creation of the world, the whole time may be summed up as follows. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the, the interesting thing is, you know, that for the most part, he's a biblical literalist with an allegorical element. He's an early bishop of, of, uh, of Antioch, but it's it's commonly argued that the Antiocene school is much less allegorical. And although literal isn't the exact right word to describe it, mm -hmm. that um, the interpretation of the Antiocene school six much more closely to biblical text. Uh, it's not necessarily literal or literalistic. You know, so for example, uh, uh, an example of that is Chrysostom, who we'll study later. It's also, I mean, in some ways a false dichotomy, but nevertheless, the general view is that the Antiocene school is uh, much less allegorical than the Alexandrian school, which is the other major school of, of um, Christian theology and, and biblical analysis or biblical interpretation. Uh, but in Theophilus, we see literalism combined with allegory. The problem with allegorical interpretation, he kind of uses typological allegory, but but the problem with allegorical inter interpretation is that it's often arbitrary. And, you know, it, it depends on the, I guess you could say, the imagination of the interpreter. And so, for example, in Book 2, Chapter 15, he says, the sun is a type of God and the moon is a type of man. Um, also, with the moon... It's, re it, it's reborn and waxes as a pattern of the future resurrection. So the sun is a type of God, the moon is a type of man, and a type of resurrected man. But that's completely arbitrary. There's no you know, reason to be see that God is the sun and man is the moon. Similarly, the first three days of creation are types of the triad of God and his logos and his Sophia. The fourth day of creation is a type of man who is in need of light so that there might be God, logos, Sophia, and man. Stars are types of righteous and godly men. Planets are type of those who depart from God and abandon his laws. Great fish and uh, carnivorous birds are types of greedy men and transgressors. Quadrupeds and wild animals are a type of those men who are ignorant of God and sin against him and mind earthly things and do not repent. Birds are a type of those who do repent because they mind the things above. And birds that have wings but can't fly are types of those who are ignorant of God and sin against him. So those are all allegorical interpretations and they're all completely arbitrary. Just maybe 
trying to make uh, make it more relatable to people. But it's his own interpretation. It's what you're saying. It's not based on anything right. solid. Right. Yeah. Right. And and then you know, sort of statements like the first three days of creation are types of the triad of God and his logos and his Sophia is really arbitrary. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no basis. Um, even for illustrative purposes or to to clarify the text for it. And the fourth day being uh, for man is not, you know, really helpful as an illustration or meaningful or even accurate. It really departs from from the biblical text. Since I've read only the first book, I, I thought it was excellent that the first, the only, the part that I read anyway, I mean, that that whole book, book one was, um, I thought it was a really good argument. People could relate to what they see, prove the, prove the existence of God by what's seen in nature. And, and then he went from there. I, I thought that was a pretty good summation. Then he, when he finally brought faith in, was wondering when that was going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, finally, it did. I, th I thought it was really a good, you know, summation of everything that could be digested, so to speak. Yeah. It was really, I think, strong. And, and the, the second book was even better or uh, better is the wrong word more detailed more detail in pointing to the uh absurdities of of the pagan religions and you know to the the pagan conception of gods and that theme was particularly important in the third book because he notes that many of the um accusations against Christians for which Christians are persecuted are behaviors that uh, are, first of all, you know, behaviors that Christians don't commit. And so Christians don't share women in common. Uh, Christian men don't have intercourse with their sisters and mothers. Uh, Christians do not engage in cannibalism. But he, he argues that, I mean, he shows that all of those behaviors are common for the gods. Mm -hmm. And the, the, in the case of Plato's Republic, even uh, recommended as ideals. And and so yet yeah, you know the gods are worshipped for doing these who do these things are worshipped, and yet Christians who don't do these things are accused of them and persecuted. He makes a really strong case there. And then also um, remember when we um, we discussed Aristides, and his contention was that. Uh, the God you worship influences, shapes your behavior. And so when gods are thought to be immoral, the result is immorality or an embrace of immorality even by those who, you know, <coughs> preach and recommend virtue or virtuous behavior. And nevertheless, there are lapses and acceptances of, of, uh, of immorality. So both he and, and, uh, Aristides you know, would agree that we imitate or can imitate 
and in his case, and in, in the case of Christians, should imitate the God we worship. Did either of you find anything else that was striking about his work? It just seemed very rational that you couldn't really, from what the one, the part that I read, you, it just seemed very logical. Yeah, it'd be hard and to argue it, against what he yeah, said. Yeah, it, would, it flowed easily and it would make sense to the, somebody if you were open-minded. So how compelling is would his argument be to either a pagan worshiper or a non-believer? They talked about how their idols are dead and they're made by man and that and they talked about who it would be who would create everything in the world the whole whole of creation mm -hmm. was somebody much bigger and mightier that and you are may, may argue you can't see him but you don't see him because of your other false beliefs. That your eyes aren't open to what God is or who God is. Would not find his arguments compelling because, uh, you know, they were not dissatisfied in their lives or, you know, everything was hunky dory. That's true. I mean, that the sin can be said for us in these times. If we're content with life, and why be swayed by other arguments or other ways of looking at things? Or swayed by the truth. Yeah, what we think is the truth. Right, right. <laughs> that's on your audience, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where the faith element comes in, I think, mm -hmm. too. We have to, it's, I mean, you have to respond to faith. Faith is a gift that has to be responded to. This represents, I mean, except for you know, dialogue with Trifo from Justin, which we didn't discuss, you know, the major thrust of the apologists that we've read has been you know, sort of petitioning the empire, um, the empire emperor to with the primary goal to show that Christians are do not deserve to be persecuted and to you know defend religious tolerance. So Aristides, you know, for example, ridiculed the gods and particularly, and you know, given that it's a sensitive thing to argue, you know, to petition the emperor who is considered to be a god to make fun of pagan deities. And so he throws in the Egyptians for kind of comic relief and Egyptian pagan religion for comic relief. But the major goal is to, to simply make it clear that Christianity is a religion that should be tolerated and should not be persecuted. And so here we move in the uh, uh, to Autolycus to you know, really a general defense of uh, Christianity with a view Presumably, since Autolycus is, is you know, described as being initially hostile, and then a friend is kind of an ordinary person, you know, someone with whom uh, the Autolycus has some sort of relationship. And so then, and it appears that all three books are, you know, they're sort of, I mean, it, it's it's you know been debated about you know whether they were uh, written as you know kind of a single work 
or whether they were you know written uh, you know sort of over a period or whether they represent portions of something that are pulled together and assembled for catechetical purposes. So the uh, so given you know really a shift of emphasis. So then the goal of the apologetic becomes justification and conversion. Yeah. That you want to touch the um, person to whom the work is addressed and secondarily, you know, an audience like him, those who, and, and so that becomes those who worship pagan religions and those who um, don't believe in God, which was probably more common, you know, in uh, the classical period than, you know, so for example, it was in the Middle Ages and until, you know, quite recently where, where atheism, atheism and agnosticism are becoming much more widespread. So how does he do with those two audiences? So for pagans, yeah. how compelling is his argument? I think it would give hope. How so? By relating the things that one sees in nature the, from in a rational sense, from what's observable. Right. to begin with, and then developing from there. Mm -hmm. Out of the universe who has made these things and is there for mankind and then becomes an individual, cares about the individual. It just kind of develops from observable nature. then becomes the personal. I think, you know, for pagans, the really strong point of the argument is his, you know, examination of the pagan gods. The, uh, you know, sort of the absurdities, the um immorality you know the fact that they were created and you know some of them created late so how can a god be pre-existed by anything how can a god be killed how can a God be eaten? How can a God occupy space? Because the space that contains a being is greater than the being it contains. Mm -hmm. Those are really, I think, really strong arguments. Are there any weaknesses in his argument? Well, when he compares the the Greek writers and the prophets, he talks about how the prophets live the experience and that's how we come to know that. Whereas the writers were writing things that had supposedly happened a long time beforehand. And they're just passing down or making things up. Was that necessarily a weakness, though? Just a... yeah. no, it's more of an observation. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a weakness to you know the extent. So the, the you know sort of the question becomes: Is it true? Mm. And so the the assumption assumptions are that Moses wrote the Torah, and that 
the Torah provides a literal description of events. And so then, you know, very few people today would argue that Moses wrote the Torah. It you know, evolved over a long period of time. Um, and, you know, especially in the early, obviously Moses couldn't, assuming that Moses did write the Torah, he wasn't an eyewitness to creation. And, you know, so you, know, can argue, you can argue that you know, the Holy Spirit provided the interpretation, but that kind of, if it were true, you know, really assumes that Moses is kind of a, stenographer or you know the uh, holy spirit speaks in his ear and and he writes it down and that's you know really not not how the whole thing works so you know the notion that moses wrote it is is uh, dubious at best um in terms of evolving over a fairly long period of time now, there are two creation stories which appear to um, reflect the traditions of of the of uh, Judah in the south and the, the northern kingdom, which are were merged into, you know, as a, merged into the beginning of Genesis. So if we look at it, they're really somewhat different accounts. They're not entirely compatible with one another. And, and so, and then he argues, you know, that, that you know, the Bible pre-exists all of the, all of, uh, you know, the pagan whatever, you know, which is also somewhat dubious. But at the same time, and so, I mean, the real strength is his criticism of pagan religion, the pagan pantheon. And also his examination of contradictions among poets and philosophers. So there, I think he does a really, really good job with you know, some limitations. His work is you know, sort of not as highly structured as, I mean, we'll read Athenagoras. I think Athenagoras is next, in fact. Yep. To his you know, sort of a much more uh, structured and organized uh, philosopher. So you can sort of compare him. So I think a very strong argument with some weaknesses. Another weakness is to identify pagan gods as demons. Uh, and we saw that Justin did that as well. There, there's a contradiction in the argument that pagan gods are either of human creation, and so we imagine them or we create these wooden or stone or whatever things, creation of our own hands and call them God. Or they're demons. You know, to me, those kind of sound contradictory. The creation with human hands is really important. And demons, you know, sort of very dubious or I would say arbitrary. But let's let's take a look at Psalm 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your mercy and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. 
They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. And we can stop there. So we can see that you know, part of the psalm is, is an explanation for what's wrong with idolatry. And what's wrong with idolatry is, first of all, it's a human creation. And second, the idol dominates the person who creates it and believes in it. So it's not merely that we worship the idol, it's the that we give the idol power over us and that the idol takes us over. I, mean, I suppose you could sort of argue that that's demonic, but it's really a matter of free choice, you know, that we choose to give the idol, which itself is powerless, lifeless, which has no power. We give that powerless thing power over us. And so those who you know, worship idols are dead. They become like the lifeless things that they worship. And you know, so we, we can see that you know, kind of in everyday life today. What do people worship? You know, some people, money is a really big thing. And where people really worship money, you know, we can see what it does to them. They're dead apart from their money. Some people worship their lawns. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I know. There, Certain there neighborhoods. A, yeah. There's a there's a discussion. Someone suggested putting out poison to prevent dogs from defecating on the lawn. Mercy. Oh my goodness. Which, you know, poison can poison who knows what, including people. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, squirrels, innocent animals. Birds. Looking for worms, yeah. It worms, right. Right. So the lawn, that person is taken over by their lawn. Right? So, I mean, think about that. That is a person who is dead. They're, you know, they're really, unless... You know, something happens to break out of that idolatry. They're simply dead. Their lawn rules them. You see it with you know people in their cars. You see it with people in their wardrobes. You see it with men who have trophy wives. Yeah. You see it with women who think they're trophy wives. And, you know, you see it with, um, in America, people and their guns. There are all sorts of forms of idolatry. And, you know, the notion that they're, they're um, I think demonic is problematic. And so the, the issue here, so when, in, in uh, creating an apologetic argument, you have to really consider the audience you're writing to and how compelling you're, you know, you're going to be. And, and so here, I, throwing in demons probably doesn't help the argument. It's much you know, better to simply focus on the absurdity of the pagan pantheon, contradictions, contradictions of you know, poets and philosophers and what they've said about the gods, the fact that they don't agree among themselves. So there he does a really good job. 
with you know some limitations. What about if the reader is doesn't believe in God at all? You mentioned Roberta that he points to the works of God in creation. That can be a real can be a really compelling argument. He doesn't you know to do it in a great deal of detail, but later we'll see you know, the fathers expand on it in great detail. One of my favorite is St. Gregory of Nyssa, mm -hmm. who writes about uh, stinging insects and spiders and coming to a knowledge of God, that we can come to a knowledge of God simply by observation of nature. Like, uh, yeah, the saints who were never exposed to Christianity. Like Saint, uh, especially, I remember is um, Saint Paquita, the African woman who was um, a slave. Uh -huh. And then she was purchased by Italians and became a slave there, but it was her her observation of the heavens, and I mean, she was compelled. Faith began in her by that contemplation. That's kind of a philosophical question I have for you, Ron, with idolatrous. Where, where does it, I mean, is there an element in everybody's heart and soul, even if they aren't baptized? Do we, do we all at the, at birth, do we all have kind of a seed of um, longing for God? I think I think the answer might be yes. But how do we come to know God or not, or become aware of God? It's not. It's kind of a puzzle. <laughs> Is the invitation mm -hmm. given outside of the faith? Yeah, the church teaches you don't have to be a Christian to come. God, Jesus can come to everyone in whatever means he wants, but the ordinary means would be through the church or the sacraments. But there's no, there's not an argument that says one must be a Christian to be saved. But is there an mm -hmm. element in every soul that exists that longs uh, for God? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, that, that's... That's a disputed question, and the church's teaching, I think, has in many ways returned to the patristic tradition since Vatican II. Within Christianity as a whole, it's really a, an extremely disputed question, with uh, in a great deal depending on you know, sort of the interpretation of John's gospel and uh, you know, no one can come to the Father except through me, which Jesus says. So, at least, you know, my sense or my view is, first of all, you know, life in all of its forms, you know, regardless of the life, human, animal, plant, all life is created by the breath of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life. So life results from an infusion of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, in that sense, God is you know, the genesis and the origin of each of us. Right. So departing from the kind of the anthrop anthropocentric view, I don't believe that God created the world for us, but rather that he created the world for and all in it to give glory to him. And so all things created are good originally. 
as human beings, we are unique in that we have free will. God gave us the, the ability and the right to choose him and to reject him and to choose him you know, if we choose him in the way that we see fit. So we have free will, but we also all in some form have a yearning for God. And you know, so in the case of idolatry, that yearning gets displaced by something. You know, so instead of God, there's our threats. Or instead of God, there's money, which you know, we think can fill some fundamental human need. So then how does one become drawn to God? And so, you know, the kind of the, uh, the major evangelical answer is that you do it through belief in Jesus Christ. You know, so you have to let Jesus into your heart or whatever. I mean, let Jesus into your heart is the <laughs> common formulation, but I, I have no idea what that actually means. Um, so the question is, then becomes who is the Lord? Who is the third person of the Trinity? And you know, so John seems to present this hardcore view, but then when we go back to the beginning of John's gospel, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So John here is, is, is basing the beginning of his gospel on the very beginning of the creation of the first creation story in Exodus. But he's really not talking about a beginning because there is no beginning because the logos, the word of God is God. And so what does the word of God do? The word of God speaks forth things into existence. And so if we go back and look at the book of the, the creation stories and kind of with kind of a Trinitarian, particularly the first one, a Trinitarian perspective, you know, we see that there's conception, God thinks, there's speaking forth, the logos speaks forth. And the Holy Spirit hovers and creates. So it's a Trinitarian process of creation. So now, you know, to put that another way, all things around us, all that is good, is created through a Trinitarian process by the Word of God. whose you know, human incarnation is Jesus. So that in turn means that you come can come through to a knowledge of God by looking at any aspect of God's creation because they all testify to and point to God. So, you know, this sort of kind of hardcore view that, you know, you'd have to let Jesus into your heart or whatever is one nonsense. And also, you know, kind of ignores that it's a process and a journey. And so given that then we have, you know, sort of a question of other religions particularly other religions. You know, and, and so the Catholic teaching is that 
all religions contain some elements inspired by God. All religions <coughs> contain some reflection of the divine and point to the divine. There are none that don't. They do it imperfectly. And it's only through the sacraments that, you know, worship and knowledge of God can reach its full potential. But nevertheless, they all point to God and contain some revelation of God. And so, you know, Catholicism above all does that. Greek Orthodoxy does it um, to nearly the same degree. The pre-Reformation faith traditions, all of which you know, sort of observe the, the uh, sacraments do. And then the non-sacramental Christian denominations and then other religions do so imperfectly. Um, but, and then also, you know, we have to recognize that it's ultimately God's grace yeah. that draws us to God. Yeah. And um, you know, that salvation is a free gift of God, that it's not, that, you know, heaven is not a meritocracy. We can't earn salvation. We can't do enough to merit salvation because salvation can't be merited. And thinking that you know, we deny that God is sovereign. But um, so that's you know, sort of my, my view of the matter, of, of the question. And, and, uh, and I think that, you know, that accords with, with uh, you know, the tradition of many of the fathers as well. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good uh, outline. And yeah, I I agree with what with what you with what you said there. And God, I'm I'm sure that we all have that. We all have a yearning of some sort. And however we respond to it is what God is looking for. And He can put in place he can draw us more and more to himself in whatever circumstances we're in no matter where we are in the world mm -hmm. but and that there might also be some responsibility on the part of those he's given more grace to like it says you know those who are given more or more is expected of them so it's incumbent on those who have more grace to share to share more and with the gifts that they have to those who may have less. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. But that, but that. God God everybody has a chance. Nobody's nobody's left out in the cold. Whatever circumstances we are mm -hmm. we have in life, from the poorest to the richest, mm -hmm. to the weakest, to the strongest. Mm -hmm. We all have we all have a calling. Right. God right. doesn't give. He he wants everybody for himself. Mm hmm. Right. He gives us the means. Mm hmm. If we can recognize it, God willing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And respond yeah. before it's too late. Yeah, and it's a process. Yeah, of, exactly. Of, of sort of growing, recognizing call of God, recognizing yeah. what gifts God has given us and how to use them 
um, and it's um, yeah, it, it's certainly true that the greater the grace, the more that's expected, and that's you know very. That's the. Uh, that's really the model of justification from the Council of Trent, which I think you know is, was the Council's finest work. Um, you know, where we're we're saved by God's grace. Yep. That's the initial starting point. God's grace creates faith. Faith and grace create a striving toward works. Works reinforces faith, which fuels more grace, which gives rise to more works. And so those three elements, grace, faith, and works, interact, driving an individual forward. So you know, more is expected. And then, you know, we also, and, and you know, what's particularly challenging is that in this process, you know, we hopefully lose our focus on ourselves and focus on God, where God becomes the totality. And we recognize that, you know, our own, our own needs are fulfilled through God, you know, and not by ourselves, um, that our gifts are gifts given us by God to be used for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. Um, and so, you know, in a literal way, we're, we're called, well, not in a literal way, in a figurative way, but in some sense, you know, from the viewpoint of one's ego, literally, we're called to die to ourselves and and to live for God. And that's, you know, it's very hard. That, yes. That really is a process that, um, you know, will go on. Forever. <laughs> forever. Till our, our last breath. Yeah, I believe. Sure. I believe that that even at the last moment for those who to our eyes to the eyes of others around us we might think that person has been a total waste <laughs> but even we don't know I think at the very last moment that everybody has a chance to say yes and that God's so merciful that mm -hmm. somebody can say yes at that very last moment not that we should waste our lives if we, if we, you know, if we interact with grace, but that everybody has a chance, even at the very, very last. Mm -hmm. Do not judge, lest you be judged. Right. Um, we have no idea, and you know, when we judge, we judge. imperfectly, um, partially, not in the sense you know, partially as in versus impartial, but we only can judge on, you know, some observable things that we can see. We can't see into the human heart. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things the Olypus you know, in his apologetics to his friend, Autolycus, was that, you know, the pagan people would look at the Christians and say, well, why do bad things happen to you? And he said, well, because there's, there's a greater reward later for us. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing now. They see you know, bad behaviors of other people and say, well, why believe in God? Why would God let that happen? Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. pretty much what he was saying back then with the pagans, you know, well, wait a minute. You know, your life isn't perfect. Things, you know, bad things can still happen to you. Mm -hmm. 
it, it becomes more problematic when the bad things that are being done by Christians, though, which is exactly you know sort of often yeah. the case today. It's yeah, uh, and I mean you know Christians are are called to imitate Christ, mm -hmm. and the irony is that the secular world expects Christians to imitate Christ. And everybody has an idea of who Christ is. And often the secular idea of who Christ is, is closer to reality than the Christian idea of who Christ is. And so, you know, when you see Christians modeling this horrendous anti-Christian behavior, mm -hmm. then that's an imitation of Christ for in the secular world and who needs that right i mean and therefore who needs god it's a renunciation of god and the fathers i mean there's also this notion that although confession took a long time as we know it took a long time to develop but but bishops, priests are given the power to forgive or not forgive sin. And the recognition in the patristic tradition is that, you know, although that's true, God is also sovereign. Yeah. And so God has the final, is the final judge. God can reverse, you know, the priest and the bishop's pope's decision. They're not God. Yeah. And and above all, you know, that you can't condemn someone to hell because only God can do that. That's important. So, you know, then also, you know, in some ways, given that you know, we're finite, that our lives are short, that we often have no idea of, you know, what we're doing, not, you know, in the sense that we, you know, don't really know, but in the sense that we intend to do something, and the actual effect of it is often, you know, very different from what we intend or imagine or would want. So, you know, one of the things is that we have no idea of how we might touch eternity and of how we might affect the kingdom of God. Comparatively small thing can have an enormous impact. You know, so, for example, you know, I don't remember his name, the person who took in Paul after he was blinded on the Damascus Road. Oh, right. He appears nowhere else in Acts or the New Testament. You know, we don't know anything about him. But so he was presumably a believer, but also imagine the enormous amount the enormous courage he had for he taking was afraid. A, yeah. a murderer mm -hmm. Saul you know was not a nice person we can find examples of that you know throughout the bible people who were insignificant you know, who did something small In the genealogy of Christ in Matthew's gospel, some women who even did something disreputable and immoral were used by God to create the Davidic line. So, you know, the fact is that we have, when we judge somebody, we have not a clue. I mean, we have to judge, you know, things that affect our behavior. You know, so it's important that we judge doctrine 
It's important that we judge theology. It's important that, you know, we have judgments in the area of the things of God that affect how we worship God. But outside of that, judgment belongs to God. I often think of, or not often, but sometimes think of about the argument for capital punishment, which, which I'm against capital punishment, just because I think you're taking, even if that person deserves what we think is reasonably, the crime was so horrific that they deserve to be put to death, but we're taking time away from them when they might come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though I suppose they could come to repentance even at the moment of execution, but I think it's an injustice in a way to have capital punishment because you're you're preventing, it could be preventing that person from coming to repentance in a more nat natural way or grace-filled way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and not only repentance, it's, um, I mean, that's, you know, certainly that's one issue. Acknowledge the is it's also taking a life and yeah. mm -hmm. who has the right to do that yeah. does does the state have the right to do that? Um, and you know then that becomes I mean you know I mean we, we, we we've seen it in, in the case of you know people who were innocent and <gasps> and condemned. Yeah. And guilty, and you know, presumably it's a jury of your peers, but particularly, you know, in the case of, of uh, you know, particularly high profile and not necessarily high profile, but you know, sort of cases with racial divides. Um, there's really a strong tendency to use the courts as an instrument of racial oppression. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, to use the justice system as, as a means of showing that everything is under control and everything is okay. You know, so this horrible, so we've caught the horrible criminal who, who uh, you know, committed this crime and, um, uh, you know we're 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 committed to keeping them in check, and you know this will serve as an example to them. And you know we, we we've seen that a good deal in our history. And you know there's also what is her name? There's a really militantly anti-capital punishment nun. She, she's living now. Is she, yeah. a, is she a medical doctor also? Is that? Um, I don't think so. No. Huh. Sister Pregian. She said at one point that most people of color in Louisiana and Texas who were facing, who had been condemned to death, were, in her opinion, innocent of the crimes. Hmm. So, so that becomes you know, both. I mean, so you know, there's the, the more abstract issue of whether the state has or should have the right to impose the death penalty, and then there's the issue of you know, the fairness of the the likely fairness of the proceeding. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know whether whether it's going to be racially motivated motivated by concerns of social class, whether you know, the person being uh, charged with murder has is facing a, a, a charge that's proportionate to you know the acts that other people have created. 
And so there's also a tendency for white people to not be charged with murder when they commit the same crimes that black people commit who are charged with murder. So there are these imbalances in the judicial system and you know they amount really besides you know the whole element of, of oppression which you know, the prophets obviously condemn, they amount to murder. The state taking upon itself the role of murderer and then having the audacity to in doing that to announce that they're executing a murderer. But if murderers should be executed, then they should sue the state oh as a whole because it's just rank hypocrisy. But we're once again passed out of time. So next week we'll do Athenagoras.